Welcome, everyone. Thanks for attending. And this is Fred Glink. I'm here with Bill Luis, who you can see is hey, here. Everyone. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that, uh, and Bill, leave that up for a little while if you would. Yeah, just so sure. Um, what we like to do before we start uh, officially is just find out where everybody's from. So in the question box, if you can just give me uh, some places where you're from, uh, what, what city, what state. Um, just always curious to see. Anybody from Casper, Wyoming? Larry, thank you. Uh, from Maryland, generically there, I like that. Um, Vancouver, Miami, Seattle, Albuquerque, New Mexico, got it. Friends in, uh, up near, that went to St. John's, as you know, Houston, Texas, Sanford, Florida. Okay, I'm a Gator. Uh, Topeka, Kansas. Where was it? Weirton, West Virginia. Well, Burke is from West. Oh, I've been to Weirton. You have? Oh yeah. Oh okay. Where is it? Where in the state? I don't remember, but I, it was back in my college days. I I went there with some friends to Weirton, West Virginia. I had some friends from there. I I had it, probably like close to Charleston, maybe. I'm I'm, I'm guessing. guessing. I'm, yeah, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um. And and Burke is from. Uh, where is he from? He's from a small town where uh, Logan. Landon Murphy's from. So Logan. Uh, Lansdale, Bellingham, Washington, Watertown, Kansas. A lot of a lot of people from all over. Anybody from overseas? Anybody from uh, 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 not counting Canada? I don't mean to make fun of my neighbors from the north, but somebody who's from across the pond. Anybody? Not outside? the Great Lakes. Las Vegas, Ulysses. I'm moving back to Anderson. I have a truck that I'm picking up next Monday. North Carolina, Greenwich, Connecticut. Oh my gosh! When in, in New York, we always used to remember that in New York City there there was Greenwich and then there was Old Greenwich, which was the truly upper crust, lived in Old Greenwich. You can Little come at some point. Uh, Steubenville, New York City, okay. Glenn, I lived on the Upper East Side for many years. Uh, there you go, originally from the UK. Okay, Phil's originally from the UK. Okay, five o'clock, top of the hour. I don't wanna hold anybody up with all of this, so here's what we're gonna do, Bill. What we decided is, and I'm gonna quickly put this in the chat box and send it to everybody, and I'll do it again periodically, which is this. That is the link to this entire presentation that we did a couple weeks back, which was seven, seven reasons why getting into voiceovers makes sense uh, as a, it's the best part-time, you know, it's, a, it's the best home-based business. But this time, we're gonna concentrate exclusively on just one of those elements. And that is the low upfront investment. So I'd like everybody, if you have questions and, and just be thinking, we're gonna go through these points, you know, one at a time over the next number of weeks, because I really want to sort of stress and, and get people to understand why this makes so much sense. So I guess my first question to you, Bill, is this. If we say to people, low upfront investment, I'm always reminded of how you got started. Why don't you tell the story of how long ago you started and how much you invested in the business, and then we'll move it from there. Yeah, it was 2016, so we're talking about 13 years ago. Um, and I had just been um, downsized from, I worked for an instructional design firm and the uh, company ended up going out of business. And so I had to, you know, kind of figure things out quickly. Um, to all in, $300. And what that consisted of was a, well, I, first of all, I set up in my closet. So I didn't, I didn't need a booth or anything. I used my closet. I, walk I bought a walk-in walk closet, right, yeah. I bought a used Windows desktop computer for $75. I uh, had a uh, Marshall MXL microphone that you can buy online for 50 bucks, 60 bucks, something like that. I bought a little um, little interface for that. I don't even remember. It seems to me maybe it's like 75 or 80 bucks. And, you know, cables and mic stand, a few odds and ends. But all in, it was $300. And here's the, here's the catch or the punchline is that I continued to use the, those uh, th those pieces of equipment for several years. I mean, I was I was well into six figures, you know, uh, before I sold any of that stuff or bought any new stuff, I should say. Yeah, and when I think about that, I think about how everyone who is starting or looking to start a business, specifically a home-based business, I'm, I'm looking at the various different options that they have and the amount of dollars involved. Now, I guess, there might be other businesses that you can start for about this much, but I really have a hard time thinking of other businesses you can start for this low a dollar number and make as much as you can on the back end. So I think that in terms of ROI, return on investment, it's probably one of the most powerful ones out there. Now, 
let's talk about that was 13 some you know odd years ago yeah. if we move it forward to now and if you could why don't we switch over to your your sheet there uh rather than this piece and let's like freelance it here so when i think about this i think about okay bill that was great back then but what about right now so i always tell people when we talk to them on our on our weekly and and, and various webinars that we do for our group I always think about the one microphone, which is the Fifine mic, which is, you can write that up there if you want. So if you wanted to get started, you need a microphone. Now, let's we can leave that blank for now. And we what else do we need? We need a, okay, so the Fifine K670. And again, that on Amazon last I saw it was 47.50. Yeah, yeah, under 50 bucks. Now, under and 50. It's, it's a really good mic. Yeah, and I would think that if you were starting today, and if we could, you know, move things forward, that if you were trying to do it really, really inexpensively, that's probably the mic you would would you probably go with, right? Yeah, back then they didn't make studio quality USB mics, so I had to stay away from it. But uh, within the past few years, they've made great advances in good studio quality USB mics. Okay, so that when we know that if you're going to start in this business, and we're talking specifically, you know, about the low upfront investment. Uh, and if you could, on the top of your of your sheet there, how to get in the VO business for practically nothing, let's put underneath there, between that and the date, low upfront investment in all caps, so that we're highlighting, that's what we're talking about today, right? Low that's upfront exactly investment. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's talk it's about the other. Yeah, go ahead. It's, it just, it's important to understand that dollars do, does not necessarily equal quality. A lot of people don't understand that. So as, as we talk about this, just keep that in mind. Dollars does not always equate with quality. So we'll talk more about that. I, I tell me more about that because I'm, I think that most people think it does. So why don't you uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, I can give you a, a, a very good for instance. And if you guys saw my email today, you saw this, but this, I actually received an email this week. A gentleman said, well, I started in voiceover eight years ago. I've spent $5,000, you know, microphone, demo, blah, 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 blah. I have not earned a single solitary, you know, penny. Uh, and he's asking, why should I attend your, you know, your, your, your uh, you know, your, uh, your, your webinar. Sorry, man, I'm, I'm, it's been a long day. <laughs> and so the, the thing is, and here's what you got to keep in mind is that having the right equipment and I, I have nothing against great equipment and someday maybe you want to invest in all of that. But it's just like we use the golf uh, analogy, just because you have great golf clubs doesn't make you a great golfer, but you can be a great golfer with not great golf clubs. You need to understand how to perform. You need to understand how to market, not just get equipment and not just perform, but this is this is as much or more marketing than it is anything else. And always remember that. Okay, well, sticking with the theme of low upfront investment, in order to get this business going, they need a microphone, but they also need a computer. A computer, uh, and let me just say, uh, the first note here is that it doesn't matter whether it's a Mac or Windows. If you, you know, whatever you've got, 99.9% .9 chance it will work fine for voiceover, even if it's an old, dusty, you know, machine that you got 10 years ago. Okay, so that computer, one that you already have, because if you're watching us right now, you have a computer it's going to be sufficient and the usb mic the fifine that we mentioned above can can plug into any computer that you have and and it will work but it will work with what software because again we also need software to record and so i think that we have to be thinking about well there's software you can pay for and there's software that's free is there anything yeah. wrong with the free software no, not at all. As a matter of fact, let me give you a few examples and we'll talk about the difference. But you've got, if you own a Mac, you probably already have GarageBand. That will work. You may own Logic, which is another Apple program. Actually, I own it as well. I don't use it for voiceover, but I own it. I use it for music. Uh, Audacity is a free program. Um, those are the uh, those are the big, the big free ones that come to mind off the top of my head. I'm sure there are others as well. Okay, so then the, the immediate question is, you no longer use a free program to record but if you were just starting out and trying to again keep your low upfront investment intact there would you have any problems using and 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 working with audacity say no as a matter of fact yeah if i was starting from scratch and i was working on a very limited budget i would definitely start with audacity it's a, it's a good program a lot of full-time successful voiceover talent use audacity and they can yeah. afford to buy something okay so then it begs the obvious question 
if if people can and and you'd suggest on a low bu- on a on a lower minimal budget to use audacity then why did you move to a different program that you have to pay for yeah i used adobe audition uh the reason was very simple i, I came from a broadcast background so i was very well versed in adobe audition i already know how you know very comfortable with it that's reason one reason two is that it's built for voice Whereas GarageBand, Logic, and a lot of these other, you know, like Pro Tools, these are built primarily for music production. You can certainly use it for voiceover, but it's way overkill. Adobe oh. Audition. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, so Adobe Audition, every, every feature in Adobe Audition is about your voice and being able to edit and make it sound as good as it possibly can, your recordings, that is. Whereas that's not the case with Audacity. Audacity wasn't built specifically for VO artists, but it can be used easily by them. Correct. And it's open source. So, you know, you may, it may have some more inconsistencies than a uh, paid program would have. But again, like I said, I mean, it's not a problem for hundreds, thousands of people who do use it. OK, so we paid 50 bucks for the mic and, and we'll talk more. I see Tony's got a question with regards to his particular mic. Let me hold that for a while. But we start with a USB mic under 50 bucks. We've got a computer that we already own, either Windows or a Mac. We've got the software Audacity, which is free. So now we're still, we've still spent under 50 bucks. Now, another important component of this business is creating your space, basically the area around your mic that is quiet enough so as not to be a problem. So how can right. we do that on a budget? You know, and let me, Fred, may I throw in something else here before we get to that? While we're talking about equipment, uh, because I've got, a, I've got a feeling people are saying, well, what about studio monitors, speakers? What about headphones? Okay. Let me just throw a few things out real quick, and then let's segue into the space, because what Fred is setting up here is actually the most important thing we're going to talk about tonight in regards to your audio, uh, and it has nothing to do with equipment. That's that's my teaser, so hang on for that. Um, okay, you do not need speakers or what's referred to as studio monitors. You do not need them. I never, I've got very expensive studio monitors. I never use them for voiceover. I only use them for demo production. Uh, because I need to be able to hear minute detail. Uh, all you need are some solid headphones. And by solid headphones, I mean, I've literally, re- literally, literally recorded with um, uh, iPhone earbuds. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not the best, but I mean, I have. I mean, I like, yeah, I've worked with earbuds. So it doesn't have to be a big investment. So I just want to make sure that that kind of covers the rest of the equipment end of things. I just want to make sure I mention that. So anyhow, yeah. uh, let's talk about, yeah, about the space. Okay. So here is maybe the most important thing you'll hear me say tonight. So I'm going to put this in all caps. Your space is more important than your equipment. What? Yet the forums are filled with thousands of people who love to talk microphones and cables and pop filters and yada yada and plugins and hardware. But yet it's not the most, I think it gives people maybe a sense of security, but it is by no means the most important thing. The space in which you record is the absolute most important component of your sound. And those two components are, one, quiet, it needs to be quiet. Number two, it needs to be acoustically treated, meaning it needs to be treated in such a way, you know, with absorbent material so that your voice doesn't bounce around and create that hollow you know, boxy kind of reverby sound. You don't want that. Um, and if you can do those two, and I did that in my bedroom closet. You know, we've got people who do it in their basements. There's all, you know, different ways to do it. There's no one set way. But if you get that right, it doesn't matter if you use cheap equipment. It'll still sound good. Okie doke. So now we've got that. Now let's see, um, how can we how can we create the acoustically treated space um, I guess the quiet is is something that we really can't, you know, that that's something you have to, how do we, how do I find the quietest yeah. space in my house to do this? Well, I, I tell you, I learned all this stuff the hard way, Fred, because I've been, you know, I, I used to scout around and, tr- you know, try different places in the house. And then, you know, I thought uh, I was upstairs in the closet and I thought that was the best place. And I was up there for s- s- years, you know. <laughs> And then after three or four years, I finally realized, no, it was my basement. I just never taken the time to really test it. Um, So what you have to do is you have to scout around your house. I mean, literally go and sit down, just sit down at different times of day because there are different traffic patterns in terms of your family, what's going on, maybe outside what's going on, airplanes, cars, and it can change, 
you know, depending on what part of day a part of the day it is. And so, um, you know, it depends on when you can work. You need you need to make sure you find the the quietest place during the time that you're available to work. And well, that's well, actually that's a big deal. I have a question though. When you say a quiet place, we're not really quantifying it. I want to quantify yeah. this. How do I determine if space A is more quiet than space B? What what tangible measurement should I take? Well, that's a great question. What we are ultimately looking for in a studio is what's called, well, this would be at minus 60 dB or decibels. That's a measurement. And um, and so, you know, if I were to turn on my recording software right now, you would see that my noise floor, meaning when I'm being absolutely quiet and not speaking and not even breathing, holding my breath, you would see the noise level in this space is below minus 60 dB. That's how quiet it is. That's what, that's Nirvana. That's what we're searching for. Now, if 60 dB is nirvana, what, what is acceptable? If you're at about minus 50 to minus 55, you can probably get by with that. If it's any louder, and by the way, the lower the number, the, the louder it's getting. As we get closer to zero, it's getting, it's getting louder. Um, but if you can get it even between minus 30 to minus 50, you can use, there are some software plugins that you can use to help reduce that background noise. And uh, I'm gonna, let me share my favorite with you right now. It's called NS1 by waves.com. It is the magic eraser of background noise. It has saved more people who were just distraught because they could not get their, you know, the noise floor. We call it a noise floor, the noise in the background down. It might be air conditioning running in the background. It could be traffic. Um, you know, it wasn't, it was just too loud. It wasn't awful, but it was too loud. And a plugin like NS1 will basically um, erase, it, erase it out of the background. Well, NS1 by Waves is very inexpensive, yet if we're counting yeah. every penny, here's the computation I think people have to make, is if they find a space, they first identify where is the quietest area in their house, and then if they have to treat that space by putting up acoustic panels or something like that, that's going to cost money. So what yeah. you're saying is, would it be, you know, I guess what I'm thinking is, again, on a budget, is it cheaper for me to go with the NS1 software or to try and do other kinds of treatment to get my noise my noise floor to an acceptable mm. level? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because, yes, software should always be the last resort. In other words, you should do everything you can do beforehand, and then you use software if needed at the end of all of that. Why? Uh, because software, you know, th there's there is no replacement for what's you want to treat it at the source. In other words, before you've added layers of extra stuff, before your hardware and everything. Uh, so, by, by what I mean by that is, you want to make sure that even before you process your voice with any equipment or software, it needs to sound solid beforehand. Because some things you cannot fix in post, as they say, and so the source material needs to be really good, and where it's coming from needs to sound pretty solid. And so if all you have left, you know, you've done everything you can do. It's as quiet as it can be. It's as treated as well as it can be. And when it's it's all said and done, it's still just a, the background, you know, the noise floor is just a little too high. That's where a software plugin can save your backside. Okay. So again, if you scroll back up to the first page that we did there, we've got the microphone. We've got the computer. We got the software. Uh, we're not going to pay for speakers. We don't need those. Need some solid headphones. Hopefully those that we already own will be fine. We're now gonna look for the best space within our house or place uh, wherever we're living, an apartment, et cetera. And we're gonna look for something quiet and, and, and acoustically treated. And then we're going to, if we, if we do all those things, we're gonna possibly use the NS1 by Waves. And how much should people be looking to pay for that, by the way? You can get it on, it normally runs, I think, close to $100, but you can get it on sale occasionally at 20, for 27 bucks. Uh, if I'm not mistaken. So all you need to do is go to waves.com and sign up for their mailing list. And they uh, they run a sale every weekend and watch for their emails and their sales. And then when it, you know, when the price hits about 27, buy, buy, buy. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So now I, I, I'm up, I'm up on all of those things that we've got so far. What else do we need to do to make this business go? We obviously then need to start finding uh, well, first off, I think the next thing would be to produce our demo, right? Uh, yeah, you know, I wanted to just throw out just a couple of acoustic uh, treatment options too for people to say, okay. I don't even know, you know, what would, what would that look like? Um, I think one of the most popular is moving blankets. Um, my son Tyler, um, where he lives, he lives uh, just a few miles away from us, 
and he's trying to set up to be able to do voiceovers from where he lives. And um, one of the things he did was he got some old couch cushions from his younger brother who just got rid of a couch. And so he's using that along with we're going to get some moving blankets. And that's how he's going to do his space. Um, so to save even more money, though, should we first start out with old comforters or something that we can find? Yeah, I mean, if you, I mean, if you're really on a, on a tight budget and you don't want to buy moving blankets, yeah, whatever you've got, maybe it's pillows, maybe it's mattress toppers. Is if it's thick and absorbent, that's what you're looking for. That is what, and there, and then uh, if you know if that's not enough, maybe you've done all you can and it's you're not, it's still not acoustically treated. You're still getting that boxy, hollow reverb sound. You might want to look into a Chaotica eyeball, and I'll just put the uh, website. We don't get paid for this, by the way. Um, Unfortunately. They, yeah, unfortunately, and, you know, this is going to cost you all, you know, like 199 bucks if you do that. Yeah. And so, again, uh, you're going to try everything else first rather than getting the chaotic eyeball to see if you get your noise floor down to minus 60 dB or so. And right. if you, um, then you won't need it. Correct. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I just wanted to throw those two things out there. I thought they might be helpful. Oh, perfect. But again, this is all about tonight is all about the lower the investment, the better. So yes. that's what I'm going here for. Um, tell me what else we need to do voiceover work and anything that we can get away with not paying too much for. What else? Yeah, we yeah well, and you you were starting to lead into this thing about demo, uh, which is really important because the way we typically get work in voiceover is we use, you know, we have a marketing tool called a demo, which is a, a recording of you, a representation of what you're capable of doing, perhaps reading commercials or uh, corporate narration, or it could be any number of things. Um, at some point in your career, you know, once you're really, you know, things are moving for you and you're, you know, you're really trying to take it to the next level, you'll probably want to look at having a professional demo recorded. But don't let all the talk and buzz about that online from other people confuse you because you do not have to have a pro demo to get started, uh, especially nowadays as there's some great platforms out there online and freelance websites in which you can do what we call a DIY demo self-produced okay. and uh basically we're for was, instance what's yeah, that so self-produced means it costs us no money if we do it ourselves right exactly i mean and and th when you think diy demo just think your voice not we're not talking sound effects we're not talking music now if you have a background if you're a commercial producer in broadcasting or something you've got the background and skills to do that you know have at it uh but understand that a good good clean great sounding audio by itself can do the job. So if you're doing a commercial demo, you know, find five, six, seven commercial scripts. You can do that, by the way, by transcribing commercials off of YouTube. Don't use these phony commercials that people write and post online because you need real commercials written by real copywriters, not and fake. Again, you can get those for free by going to either YouTube or iSpot.tv yeah. and transcribing them yourself. That's exactly right. And that's where you get the good copy, iSpot.tv. There you go. And um, so, yeah, DIY demo. And especially if you're using uh, freelance uh, platforms like Upwork, Freelancer.com, Fiverr.com, which, um, you know, I was talking to Fred about this earlier. M my daughter just made 4000 bucks this past month on Fiverr.com. Uh, there's some great new platforms out there. And by the way, you should also mention how long has she been on Fiverr? Oh, five or six months. It's not like she's been in there for years. No, no, no. She just started in the spring. Got it. So now you've got a free place to get clients from, whether it's there or Upwork or any of these other freelance sites, because they don't charge anything up front. They just take a piece of the action themselves, right? Right. At least Fiverr does. I'm not sure how Upwork and some of the other, I'm sure each site has its own thing as to how they operate. But with Fiverr, it's they just take 20% of what you earn. Right. So now we're getting to, I mean, again, we're still keeping our investment as low as possible. And we're looking for our setup, uh, doing our DIY demo, doing all these things and then finding the customer. So now I found the customer. I presume that if I get a customer on any of these sites that are free, if we're trying to keep our investment low, I can do it and deliver the job without having to pay any additional dollars over what I've paid thus far. Right. That's correct. Yeah, because once you have the equipment set up, once you're able to record good, solid quality audio, and again, as we've shown, you can do that uh, for next to nothing. Um, you know, you record it, you edit it, you send it out, and you're done. 
Jimmy noticed you put iSpot tube. It's iSpot t a dot TV. I spot do <laughs> Thank you. Not even close. I had YouTube on the brain. Yeah. And yeah, so for that. Um, and so here now, we've now laid it out. And so what I want to do at this point uh, is open it up for any questions that you have because I anticipated this particular webinar being primarily about your questions. So before I said that, everybody had already started putting some questions in here. Uh, Audacity and NS1 isn't compatible. No, nope, that's not true. Talk to, talk to us about that build. Now, you don't use yeah. Audacity, but we've heard that argument before. I've got hundreds of students in my private coaching program, and, uh, and they are successfully using it. So do a little more research on it. Now, I'm not, I don't use Audacity, so I can't speak directly to it, but I do know we've got students using it. Yeah, in our groups, we've heard that before, and we've also seen people that have figured out the solution. So although that's, you know, a lot of people bump into that problem, that isn't the, the truth. Um, Dina says, if you say the equipment is less important than the acoustically treated space, then what would you say about those who contend that you have to spend outrageous sums of money for better output? Uh, I think they're, you know, they're they're either uninformed or they're well-meaning and they just don't understand because I'm you're talking to a guy who did it on practically nothing. And I did national TV ads on that $50 microphone in my closet and nobody knew the difference. Well, let's, uh, get, I, let's get cynical for a second, Bill. <clears throat> what would their agendas be if they said that? Perhaps. Well, you know, yeah, per, they're probably entrenched in an older business model of voiceover, um, you know, and, and they think it's all about the sound of your voice and how well processed it is. Might, um, might, they, might they also be trying to sell you demo services or audio production services? Yeah, I was trying to be very kind, but yeah, it's probably, <laughs> that's probably the end game. Got it. Um, okay. Ron is saying, will the NS1 plug-in work with Audacity on a Mac? Yeah, we had that discussion. Yes, yeah. it will. Right. Uh, what device are you using to check dB levels? That's a good question. Yeah, I don't use a device. All I do is I open up my, um, my DAW, my recording software, Adobe Audition, and I hit play, or I hit record, I'm sorry, and then I sit quietly and I watch. Because, you, you know, you can, read, you can read the levels, the audio levels in your, in your digital workstation. And that's how I do it. Yeah, so what you do is you hit record in Audacity or whatever program you're using, stay completely quiet, and see what the sound is when there's no sound at all. Yeah, and it may not be the most scientific. I mean, there could be arguments against, against that, but I'm telling you, I've done this for 13 years. What you want to do is, first of all, make sure that your microphone level is set to peak at about minus 3 dB when you're recording at normal levels. And that way your microphone has the right, you know, you have the right gain or the right input. Then you sit quietly once you have your, your microphone levels set properly to peak at minus 3 dB. Then you sit quietly and you watch the meter and see where it peaks. Gotcha. So Gerald says, I picked up a fan-free solid state computer with Windows 10 for less than $100 to use my walk-in closet studio space. Boom. Good. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I hate to use it mic drop, but I'm sorry. It's a... <laughs> and by the way, computer fans are your biggest enemy. For I mean, they all have them. Uh, but uh, you're going to need to, like, for instance, um, my computer is actually about eight. Let me turn on my, my camera here. As you can see, I'm actually in a recording booth. Uh, it's just a little three and a half by five foot thing. My computer is about eight feet outside of it. And I just have long cables running in here in which I have my computer monitor so I can run my mouse and my monitor and all that in here. But the computer's out there, so it doesn't make any noise. Okay, two comments on that. Number one comment is you keep the computer out there because the computers have a fan inside them, correct? Yes, correct. The second comment is this. Is, the, is anything that's emitted from the screen, is there any buzzing or whatever you have to worry about? No, that's never been a problem for me. As a matter of fact, I'm using an LG, uh, a 27-inch LG monitor that's literally about 13, 14 inches from my face right now. It might might blind me eventually. I have no idea, but there's no noise coming from it. Okay. Uh, Gerald also went on to say, what's your recommendation for acoustic treatment for someone who doesn't have the money for acoustic panels? I think we said that. Uh, mattress toppers, old, um, you know, old comforters, quilts. Comforters. Yep. Yeah. There you uh, go. Couch cushions, couch cushions. Couch cushions, there you go. And again, explain your situation for those who haven't heard it when you travel down to your place in Hilton Head. Uh, and by the way, you know, a lot of people um, want to know, just so that we have credibility with the audience here, you're now in year 13 or 14. I always get confused with what it hey, is. It's 13. 
but this year you're on target to do close to four hundred thousand dollars a year in voice work, correct? Cor correct. And just to remind people, because they hear it from so many other people, I want to remind them: what percentage of your work comes from those fancy agents that get you all that work? It's less than a half of one percent. Less than one half of one percent. Okay. Um, so Richard's question is moving on. Uh, but could you? Uh, could you overproduce your recording so your demo sounds better than you actually are? That would cause <laughs> issues, right? Richard, good question. Yeah, well, here's the thing with processing. Uh, a little, use a little, not a lot. The temptation is to think, well, if I keep adding, if I add more EQ, more compression, more processing, it's going to keep sounding better and better. Uh, you will reach a point of diminishing returns very quickly when it comes to processing. Just kiss it, as I always say. Kiss it with some compression, kiss it with some EQ, and you should be good. There you go. Joe says, can't Audacity perform the same function as NS1? The answer is no. No, they're two separate things. Uh, Audacity is a recording program. NS1 is a noise reduction software. Okay. And this question, I, I'm, I'm going to read it as is. Um, and, and it's well, maybe an English issue here. So basically, can I'm going to reword it. Can, can okay. one get their money back? in a year or less. Given the amount of money we're asking you to spend here, I'd say you can get it back in less than two weeks. Oh, yeah, 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 no, 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 it should, I mean, geez, I would be looking, for what we're talking here, I would certainly expect to get it back within a month or two at the very most, very yeah, most. There you go. Um, fee fine, we put that up there, the fee fine, uh, K670, that's the mic Scott was asking. Dustin, um, yeah, I mean, Dustin, we're trying to, he, he, he says something about something that's cost $199. Uh, yeah, it's great if you got the 199 bucks. This particular webinar is all about keeping it super cheap. Yeah. Um, when you make a demo, how long uh, would you wanna wait to make the second one? Well, we tell the people that are our, in our VO Blueprint group, and by the way, let me send out again, um, let's see if I can, again, remind you, if you wanna go see the entire presentation we did on this, these all seven steps, there it is again in the chat box. But the question is, how often should should one redo their demo? Tell this gentleman what we recommend people do when they're first starting. Okay, I'm going to put it up here. I'm going to highlight it because this is really important. Um, you need to re-record your DIY demo at least once every week for at least two months. Why? Because you will get better rapidly early on. And, um, you know, in week two, you're going to sound better than in week one. Your editing skills will be better. This is a good chance to keep developing your performance skills and your editing skills. By the end of month two, you've done this thing like eight times. It's going to be way better than your first take. And so just keep redoing it and upload it and replace the old one and keep doing that for at least two months. I realize from the next question and what we're just talking about, we've left something out, which is how do I take my audio and put them up someplace that won't cost me a lot of money? The question was actually regarding when you should do a website, but in the meantime, we need something called SoundCloud. Yeah, and I should mention, you know, you, you know, what we're talking about, you don't even need a website when you first get started. You will eventually, when you're doing like direct marketing or trying to get an agent, those kind of things, but that's not where you should be starting. So you don't need a website at first. Your the platforms you use, Fiverr, Upwork, such and such, that those those are your websites. And then I'm sorry, Fred, what was the question you just asked? Uh, let me check because I've now forgotten it. Um, it actually has to <laughs> basically, he wanted to know about a website, and I'm saying that the tool that we want to use is SoundCloud. Oh, to SoundCloud, put, yeah. Put our audio up there. We don't need a website. We need a link to SoundCloud that will give people access to our latest DIY demo. Yeah, you just go to SoundCloud.com, and you can set up an account for free. And you can upload any audio, like your your demos, you can upload them, and then you can create a link that you can share those with people. You can send them to people or put them in your email uh, signature line. You know, um, you could even send projects. Well, I wouldn't send projects to clients like that because you don't want to share it with the world. Um, but anything like demos, which are public material, would be perfect for this. Got it. By the way, speaking of that right now, I know you send it with other means. Is, there, is it not possible to send a client a finished product using the Google Drive? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've got clients that, that share stuff with me with Google Drive. We use Dropbox. Um, I have found the simplest for me is I just use WeTransfer. There's no one right answer uh, as what long as they can it? easily that access it. That What's cost? that? How much does that cost? It's free. Okay. There you go. And, you can, and here's what I like about it. You can send up to two gigabytes in one email without creating an account 
and and send multiple emails. You don't have to, or I'm sorry, multiple files. They don't have to be zipped. That's okay. what I like about WeTransfer. Do me a favor. Go back up to SoundCloud.com and put there to host your audio files for free, and then we'll put tell people what WeTransfer is. Audio files for free. Yeah, and then WeTransfer is to send to clients for free as well. Yeah, projects for free. There we go. Oh, there you to go. clients. Uh -huh. Yeah, because that's. I just want to make sure everybody understands what the uses are for each of these, um, and 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 have that quick. Now, this is a question we get all the time, and we clear it up in in all of our group discussions with our with our people in our group. Which is Dominic is asking, are you violating any copyright laws by transcribing either things off of iSpot or YouTube? Yeah, no, it's called fair use. And um, as long as you're not selling it for profit, in other words, you know, you're not creating, recreating somebody's work and selling it to somebody else, um, you can you're just doing it for demonstration purposes. This is to demonstrate your capabilities. And it's common practice. I've never known of anyone, of all the thousands of voiceover talent I've known, I've never known of anyone to have any issue with this. Um, this question regarding a specific, um, I've never heard of this. Have you heard of Casting Call Club? Uh, no, no. I, There's a lot of different platforms, but I'm not familiar with that one. Got it. Will is asking, and this is an interesting question that I don't think I've seen that much. Uh, if you use copy from a commercial that already exists, let's use yours, Walmart, as an example. Mm -hmm. Is there ever a chance that the casting person, director, might end up comparing my recording with the original ad yeah here here's the that's a really good question and here's the, my rule of thumb as a as a rule it's usually not it's not an issue uh unless it's something that's extremely well known like remember back when john krasinski was doing uh was it progressive could not progressive but there was some uh insurance and they yeah. were very well known very popular if you were to do that people would be comparing your voice to john krasinski and you don't want that so, but most of your commercials out there, even national commercials, people, they can't identify the voice. They don't know who the voice is. But right. if it's highly identifiable, I wouldn't do it. Exactly. You know what I'm thinking of for that is Dennis Leary with Ford, or is it Chevy? Or yeah, no, yeah, Ford. That's F-150. That's a great example. Yeah, because it's highly identifiable. Everybody knows that's Dennis Leary. Don't try to outdo, don't try to out Dennis Leary, Dennis Leary. It's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, got it. Okay. Chris is at, Chris, good comment from Chris. He says, if you need a cheap computer, search for local university surplus sales. Wasn't oh, great. Working. Thank you very much for that. Gerald says, uh, post recording editing advice, silence between words or no? No, 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 no. Um, and so I'm glad you asked that question. Silence is not good. Quiet is good. Silence is not. There, there's a definite difference. Silence means the lack of any sound which by its by its absence that vacuum is actually definitely loud it draws attention to itself and so in other words think of it this way if you're if you're silencing between words i speak and then there's nothing you're like whoa what was that and then i speak again then there's nothing you don't want that what you want is what you, the, the the natural sound of your room below 60 db because it does not draw attention to itself and that's what, what we're looking for and what bill refers to that as is room tone which room is tone right when you have a gap, you put room tone in there, which is the sound of your room when nothing is happening. That's basically how you create your noise floor, but you're off, there is a, a, sl a slight sound coming, but it's very unnoticeable unless it were compared to no sound and then it would be right. really different. I hear sometimes people do that, it sounds terrible because it, it distracts from what you're recording. And people are like, what in the world is that? All of a sudden there's nothingness, there's, you know, there's a void there and you don't want that. Now, Larry wanted you to go back to where you've got your up at the top there, Fiverr.com and the two R's. What are the two R's? Uh, two R's at the end of Fiverr. It's all, Fiverr with two R's. I just wanted Fiverr to point that exactly. out. Yep, you got to spell with two R's. Um, Upwork, Fiverr. There's a few different, Scott. There's a few different, uh, you know, if you wanted to find more different sites where you could do freelance work, just go freelance voiceover sites. Uh, just be careful because, you know, you really have to vet these places. We've mentioned the ones that we know and, and kind of trust. There are a lot of them out there. And, and the, the big scam you have to look out for is why don't you tell people, just so they know, if you hear this story, you should run in the opposite direction and you know what the one I'm talking about. 
Well, somebody just contacted me this week, and I assume this is the one you're talking about, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was some deal where they wanted to pay me to do something first. And whenever somebody's offering you to pay you money to then buy something back from them, or like I had a guy this week uh, actually want me to help him get back uh, to set up a fake profile that he could use. Uh, you know, things that just don't make sense. And Fred, you may have, you may be thinking about something different than those, the but those are two that I faced this week. The thing that I'm thinking about that we hear all the time is uh, we're going to uh, want you to go to a specific studio in a town near <laughs> you and right. they have you either pay them or pay whatever. There's some kind of a deal where money is exchanged when you don't think it should be. You, you know that that's a scam. Right. So, There's always people out there looking to take advantage of people. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, you basically take the Nigerian two, $23 billion deal and put right. it into voiceover with smaller numbers. People are looking to steal small amounts of money from voice talent, and they do it in very creative ways sometimes. And we've had some people get, get conned, but again, we, we're on a mission to try and spread the word there about how not to have that happen. Right. Um, do you EQ, Brian is asking, your recording to compensate for a cheaper mic? Do you have to do EQ, doing EQ work to compensate for a, ba a cheaper, quote unquote, but I, don't know, it's, I wouldn't say bad, a cheaper mic. Now cheaper, let's understand, Brian, uh, there are people that, that we know that are using mics for under $100 doing national commercials. Yeah, so keep this in mind. It's not, you may need to EQ, but it's not a function of how cheap or expensive your microphone is. Uh, I use, I have a $1,000 Neumann microphone that I use. I EQ because my voice is different than yours. So it's a really, it's a function of your voice and the microphone together, not the price that you paid for it. That's what you're you're compensating for. There you go. I didn't know that. I learned something there myself. Yeah. Um, so Damon asked a good question, which is how saturated is this career space? And the answer that I'd like to give, we talked about on our weekly meeting this morning with our group, which is it is very saturated. If you're trying to do the traditional thing, why don't you explain kind of the two approaches to this business and which one is saturated and why. So here's the, tr you know, traditional, and this is very saturated. It's where you get an agent and then you compete for the same jobs, everybody else with those agents. What happens is the same, the same, the same jobs get posted with sometimes every agent in America simultaneously. So it could be you and thousands of the best talent in America going for the same commercial. That is a very, very saturated space. However, if you market yourself directly, are there a lot, there's certainly a lot of voiceover talent out there, but there is, the market is expanding rapidly. Media is cheap to create, especially in the corporate world. Oh my gosh, e-learning, explainer videos, it's there, everybody makes them now because they're so stinking cheap to make. And so, you know, people need voiceover talent. I can't, I can't imagine a day when there will not be demand and that where it'll be terribly difficult to get work. So if you were just guessing, and again, purely speculation, last year, 2018 compared to 2019, how big, how much bigger do you think the voiceover field has grown? Probably at least 10 or 20%, right? You mean in terms of people, people entering it or the market itself? The amount of money spent on voice work. Or the oh yeah, I mean, boy, I wish we could measure that. I, but you know, I wouldn't doubt if it's growing at least 10 to 15% a year. Yeah, and so when people tell you, Damon, uh, that this career space is saturated. It's saturated if you want to use fax machines. And by that, I mean, if you're gonna use old technology and old thinking, yes, this space is saturated. There are people that don't want you in this space because they, they perceive you as competition. Keep, you know, keep that in mind. And then there are other people who use that as an excuse because they don't know how to succeed. So Got therefore, it. therefore it must be saturated because I can, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. But I'm telling you, if you if you get if you have great audio, you can record solid demos and you develop your performance skill set and you understand how to market, you will get work. OK, I don't want to butcher the uh, la uh, the first name because I, I even with my you know language skills, I'm not sure what it is. But someone with the last name of Burke uh, says, I line the walls of my room with carpet underlay works great. Absolutely. I'm not surprised. And by the way, you can get remnant carpet. It may not look real good or have the right color but it'll be cheaper. We used to do that in radio. Our production studio would be lined with carpet. So been there. Okay. Uh, again, talking about specific mics, I prefer not to do because again, it's it's not about the equipment. And I don't uh, even keep up with that stuff, guys. I don't even know what the latest models, nor do I care. Yeah. Um, how much should you, 
huh, I'm not really sure what this question means, but if you're just getting started out, like how many auditions might you be doing a day? Well, that all depends on what platforms you're on. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're like doing, you know, pay to play sites like voice realm, voices.com, voice one, two, three, you know, you may be doing 40, 50 auditions a day. If you're just, if you're on freelance websites, you might not be doing any auditions because in those environments, people are basically contacting you for work as opposed to you auditioning. Now let's talk about doing. that. People I'm sure here have, who are on the webinar have heard about the, what we call the pay to play sites, voices.com, voice one, two, three, where you pay to get on those sites. Number one, our philosophy here is low investment, and why else, other than the cost of those, shouldn't people just starting out be on those sites, Bill? It looks easy. It's not. It's it's a much more competitive level, and you should be there, but not today when you first get started. You need great. You need really strong performance skills. You need great world class audio, and you need great demos. And you need to understand the platform. If you understand those four things, you'll be fine. But you don't learn that your first week or even month in voiceover. Yeah, and so for many people, what we recommend, uh, and all the members of the Blueprint Group are told that they should be using all of the money from the freelance sites and their inexpensive equipment to finance the cost of a professional demo right. and deal with the professional demo to finance the cost of the pay-to-play sites. So you're, need, you're gonna need to be making $5,000 or more from other sources before you even consider those, correct? Yeah, if not, you're going to beat up pretty bad. I don't even know you, but I can tell you because I've seen, I've talked to hundreds and thousands. I've, I've been on these sites for like 12 years. I know them really, really well. And I, you know, people get beat up really bad, not because they're not good. They just don't understand how this all works. So you really have to learn and, 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 and you know, I prepare. Up, I beat up really good. We heard somebody who did over 500 job auditions for jobs uh, and got zero work. And you just don't want to have, I don't care how thick skinned you are, that's gonna hurt. It'll play with your head and what your assumption is, well, I'm no good. Well, that doesn't mean you're not good at all. It means you don't understand what you're doing is what it means. Exactly. Now, Patty, again, brings up a comment and a question that is taught by the old guard and I think there's a reason for it. She says, Pleasant, pleasantly surprised to hear of acceptance of USB mics. I've heard much about USBs not being acceptable. Who are the people that would be saying that, Bill, and what would their motivation be? Well, these are people that, that think that, that only jobs are gained through agents and you travel into high-end studios and major markets. Um, the, the truth is the technology has advanced rapidly. And um, if you do a YouTube tube search, you'll find some, there are some really good engineers out there who talk about them and how worthy these good USB microphones are. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so let's see if we get to, to Matt's question here. Uh, okay, okay, so he's going back, Matt's going back to how you select uh, the commercials that you use. Are there any specific things to look for with the transcriptions, length, tone, TV versus radio? Yeah, I, I like all TV. Um, they tend to, I think, position you a little more strongly because typically TV commercials, they're harder to get, they pay more, it's a bigger deal, generally, generally speaking. Um, so you want, like for a commercial demo, it needs to be about 60 seconds long uh, in total. And you want anywhere from six to eight commercial segments, not entire commercials. It could be, you know, like 10 seconds of each uh, to do that. And you want to make sure you're not redundant. There's no point in doing six commercials if they all sound the same. So you might want to do one, you know, that's like, uh, you know, very high energy. Like I, uh, on my video, I have a video demo where I do uh, commercials for like North e Northeastern Honda dealers. It's very up-tempo and it's very like this. This, you know, this week only, 169, blah, blah, blah. So like a high energy, there might be one maybe for a healthcare type uh, place where it's more compassionate and sincere. You might do one where you're just the guy or girl next door, you know, just happy to be here. So you what you want to do, the point is you want to find four, five, six different aspects of your personality to express in a script. That's the best way to put it. Don't be redundant. Got it. I, I, that makes total sense. Um, Adam's asking, when you're editing your demo or other work, what are some things you look for? In other words, if I record it and it sounds good, what things should it be focus, focusing on to make it perfect? Well, I don't know should, that you should ever be in search of perfect um, because you may never get there. I may never get there. You know what I mean? You, you, at some point, you got to go with what you, what you got and trust that you're going to keep getting better as you go. Um, but what you want 
when somebody listens to your demo, and if you have a spouse or a partner or a friend who can give you honest, objective input, it's not about the sound of your voice. I cannot overemphasize this. It's not about how good your voice is. It's about how relatable and believable you are. And if somebody listens to you, they shouldn't feel like you're reading to them. They should feel like you own that experience, that you've been there, you understand it, that you're, if it's a car sale, hey, you know, you own, you own that place. You're, you're truly, sincerely excited about it. You know, if you're talking about a hospital, that you were the patient there, that you understand what they feel or that you're the doctor. Um, get somebody objective to get you some feedback as to whether you sound believable. That's what you're looking for, not the sound of your voice. No, believe me, clients could care less about the sound of your voice. What they care about is, can I believe this person? Perfect. Yeah, I agree. You, uh, Ulysses, I'm going to ask you a question uh, a little bit uh, a little bit different. Um, the, his question, I'm going to ask it this way. If you, could, if you were kind of trying out to get approved by ACX for the reads that you were doing, could you do it in South Carolina with a fee-fine mic and some couch cushions? Yeah. Yep, uh, I do. You know, we we started to mention this earlier, but yeah, I, my wife and I have a place down in South Carolina, a vacation house, and and when we go down there, I um I set up a couch cushion studio. Go to my YouTube channel, you and you can see it. And I do all my work down there for my clients, and nobody ever even notices. Yeah, and so in answer to your question, I'm sure Ulysses has been uh, has gotten some rejections from ACX for some of his work, and you'll also get it from the, some of the other voice funny is one that's super like picky about the sound. But again, if you do what we said to do earlier in terms of creating the space, you're not gonna have those problems. No, and you know what, maybe, uh, let me, put, I'm gonna put down my email. I My son is an audio engineer and he consults people on getting good studio sound. And um, I'm just gonna put this. Yeah. And he's cheap. And uh, it might be a good introduction into kind of what all we do. This is just a very small aspect of it. Yeah. But anyhow, I'm just gonna put that up there. Yep, 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 perfect. And again here, um, also as you go through, you know what, uh, when we get close to the end here, I'll have you put up uh, a way and I'll talk to people, you know, who might be serious about some things here um, and, and really wanna move forward in terms of VO work. But Mandy's asking, what options do you recommend? Or to, we already did that, Mandy. Uh, we, we recommend or Bill recommends we transfer. I, met, I, I said Google Drive, but we transfer works perfectly and it's free. Uh, does standing versus sitting make a difference when recording, Chris is asking? You know, it's whatever's comfortable for you. You've got to experiment. There are no rules. That's the main thing. There's not, you must stand, you must sit. I sit, but I record on average five to eight projects a day. You know, I spend a lot of time recording, so it's more comfortable for me to sit. Um, I could do it standing up as well. I don't think it's that big of a deal, but do what works best for you. Experiment. Okay. And Dustin's asking whether or not uh, Mandy, uh, Mandy.com, Mandy, and then he mentions Voices.com, which we've spoken about. Is Mandy a subscription site now? I forget. Yeah, you have to pay now to be on there. Uh, if you're looking for clients, just Google uh, video production companies. There's tens of yeah. thousands of them. Yeah, you want to get started for no money at all. You Google video production companies, uh, call them all up and, and just see if they're willing to listen to your demo. We have a specific kind of system for that but that's basically what it is yeah um let's see let's see here again uh, <laughs> uh mark you've been listening to too many uh conspiracy theorists on uh on youtube or social media he's saying have you heard of any voice talent being blackballed by the production companies for being on fiverr no you know what i've heard people say that that is the biggest but if, you know first of all let's just say that's true Really, I mean, are you telling me that these these people have nothing better to do than to search Fiverr so that they can blackball people? That is like that's the craziest thing ever. And if, I mean, if that's what they're doing, you know, screw them. You've got a career to build. Who cares? Don't build your career based on what per one person or two people out there are doing. Who cares? You have thousands of opportunities. Don't allow that kind of crap. That stuff makes me angry. That's that's nonsense. Absolute utter nonsense. Yeah. And Stephen, a Zoom portable recorder will not be sufficient. Uh, Reaper is another program, John. Again, it's not free. I believe it's paid. So right. Reaper, but it's pretty inexpensive. People, yeah, a lot of people like Reaper from what I've heard. But again, it doesn't really matter. Your success in voiceover is not going to be dependent on which of these systems you use. Uh, 
Yeti studio mic all in one. Uh, not sure. I, I would know. stay away from a Yeti. Yep. Um, yeah, you're you're a good interface. If you cannot afford an Apollo twin, go buy a uh, USB mic. Um, that's what I've been saying there. Uh, again, if you've got if you don't have a USB mic and you're trying to plug it through some kind of a device, so what would he use instead a of Focus oh, right Scarlet Solo? You can get for under a hundred bucks. There you go. Um, okay, let's see here. What about devices? Let's see. I think we answered that. I'm just trying to get through as many of these as I can because I know we're getting late in the game here. Uh, about cheap moving blankets at Swap O Rama flea market. I love it. Hey, there Swap, you go. Swap O Rama. Gotta love that. Um, oh my God. You know, D Douglas. Let me just tell you, the answer to your question is yes. Can you actually do paid work with homemade recording booths like the ones on YouTube? We have people making over $100,000 a year in our group who have their own creative recording booths. So the answer is yes. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, let's see. Adobe does have, or Audacity does have a built-in nose reduction plugin, not as good as NS1. Um, Dominic, as it relates, so Dominic's answer, asking a question about our program, the Blueprint program. Go ahead and just, if you would, and let me talk about this as you pull up the presentation from before and, and switch to the end where it talks about the way to get uh, set up an appointment to see. What we do is, and while Bill is pulling that up, I think it's, I forget the the last, is it, I forget what the website is that we use again. Is it 3Fred or what would we use? Uh, huh. What in the world? I can't, I can't what? find it. Yeah, I forget what it was here. Yeah, well, you I know can, what? The website's three Fred. I can put that up here. Okay. Well, you know what? Why don't you pull that pull that up real quick? Right, do you, can you access your browser? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll do that right now. Let me just yeah. switch over to that. There we go. And um, guys, five minutes. If you type in three Fred, the number three Fred.com, this is where okay, it will take Leave that up a second. And if you could zoom in on that left hand side. Uh, oh, I don't know how to do okay. that. Okay, well, let me read it. It says, please only schedule a call if you're serious about this. So if you're curious about the blueprint program, but let me read the rest of it. This call should take between 20 and 30 minutes. You must fill out the application which follows this booking, or your appointment will be canceled. This is not cheap, but we do have a payment program. Just follow the instructions uh, to, to schedule your call. It's fast and easy. So if somebody wants to see if Bill's blueprint program, which is primarily, it's got three parts, but it's, it's primarily a marketing program, but it's got three pieces to it. It's got 70 hours plus of online video and, and audio training. It's got uh, weekly webinars that we do three to five times a week. And the third component is the Facebook group, which Bill, you get to watch him live. And by the way, whenever I talk to people over the phone, and Bill, I want you to uh, bag me up on this and just to give me your comments. Whenever I talk to people on the phone in these appointments, I always ask them, I, they say, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at some other coaches. I said, fine, do me a favor. When you talk to other people that are doing coaching, just ask them if they have a studio in which they broadcast live from every day when they're in the studio uh, during normal working hours, unless they're under a non-disclosure agreement, do, do people get to see them day in and day out do their work? And the answer is, uh, uh, you know, it's crickets because Bill is the only, repeat, the only person in the industry that does this. Why? Because I suspect that many people, if they had a studio mic and a camera on, there would be no activity going on because they're trying to solicit people to get coaching work rather than doing voice work. I'm sorry, but I've seen a lot of it. People who are soliciting to get you to use them as a coach, just ask them a simple question. How much money did you make last year? And if they're not making a whole lot of money, I'm, my question to you is, why are you going to coach with someone who isn't making money if that's what you want to do? This is a business. It's the voiceover business. It's not the voiceover hobby. So we see this as a business. And if you do too, feel free to get on to, again, it's three, the number three. Put that up back on the screen, Bill, and I'll... We'll put that. So it's the number three. We'll put it in big letters. The number three and then Fred.com. Three Fred.com. But again, if you're truly serious, you're going to go to there, set up an appointment and make sure and fill out the application. If you don't fill out the application, I basically cancel your call because without that, I can't give you good feedback. Now, 
A lot of questions we took in a lot of, uh, you know, in a very short period of time. Bill, do you have any final thoughts before we send people on their way? VoiceOver, this is a much more accessible business than most people realize. And um, you need to understand, as Fred just said, it is a business. And so make sure you're learning the things that will help you to succeed as a bit. Don't be this guy who spent 5,000 bucks and got nothing for it. Don't be that guy. And, um, and, you know, if you're serious about this, we'd love to work with you. If not, thanks for taking the time to be here. You know, we enjoyed it. Hope you did as well. We'll see you next time. Thank you, folks.